all engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, advances, questions, research, technology, unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello and welcome to The Naked Scientist, the show that brings you the latest in science, technology, medicine and much more. I'm Harry Lewis and this week we have those first stars that graced our universe, a tiny computer's unlimited potential and what we can learn from the sexuality of primates. More often than not, your ideas help inspire our shows and steer our conversations. So if there's something you've always wanted to know about tech, medicine, engineering, etc., you can ask us. We love to get to the bottom of scientific conundrums here. If you head to thenakedscientist.com and click onto our Ask a Question tab, you can submit whatever queries have been on your mind. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by ukfast.co.uk. We have a truly delectable selection of scientific sweets for you to sample. And without further ado, let me whet your appetite and introduce the panellists. First up, it's Eben Upton. He's not only a local Cambridge celebrity, but he's a global celebrity due to the creation and distribution of his Raspberry Pi. And I'm sure, Eben, that a lot of people know what a Raspberry Pi is. But for those that don't, and if it's not ringing any bells, it's not a type of pastry or dessert, is it? It's less delicious than it sounds. Um, so it's a it's a it's a credit card sized computer. It's a PC. Plug it into a monitor. Plug a mouse and keyboard into it. We created it to try and get young people excited about computing again. And how's that going? Have you managed to get young people excited about computing? Uh, we have. Well, we've sold forty. We've sold forty six million um, of them over the last over the last decade. Quite a lot of those to children. Um, and if we have one number in mind when we're thinking about Raspberry Pi, how many young people are applying to the universities here in Cambridge uh, to study computer science? The number for the University of Cambridge has gone from about two hundred and fifty in two thousand eight to about fifteen hundred last year. So we think we're making some progress. Yeah, definitely. We've also got astrophysicist Emma Chapman from the University of Nottingham. Emma has a book coming out called First Light, where she shines the spotlight on the first stars that ever graced our cosmological universe. In fact, I probably should say, Emma, that the first star shined and you go in search of it. So before I embarrass myself any further, you know those um, presents that you can buy where you get to name a star for somebody or you get to buy a star for somebody? How do they make you feel? Well, I have one um, from, <laughs> from when I was a teenager. I think it's what every astro enthusiast gets from their family who doesn't really understand them. Yeah, I mean, they're a money making scheme, right? But if it makes you feel more enthusiastic about astronomy, it's fine. <laughs> I bought one for my physicist partner and she was less than enthused by it. Yeah, that didn't go down very well. <laughs> <laughs> On to our next panellist, it's Siddhartha Ribeiro, Professor of Neuroscience and former Director of the Brain Institute of Federal University for Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil. Siddhartha's new book, The Oracle of the Night, explores advances that neuroscience, biology and psychology have made into the connections between sleep, dreams and learning. Siddhartha, are we the only animals that dream? Most likely not. Experiments have been run in the 60s to show that when cats have uh, their muscles disinhibited during REM sleep, they will act out species-specific behaviors that suggest they're actually dreaming. And actually, when we observe our pets, we, we get that sense, right? And finally, we have a bonobo on the panel. Oh, crikey, how rude of me. We have a bonobo expert. It's primatologist Franz de Waal from Emory University in Atlanta. Franz has a book called Different Hitting the Shelf Next Month, a comparison of gender and sex between primates and humans. Franz, here's the question. You must think that I'm the alpha male of this panel show. Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> is the way in which I've used that word a fair representation of how we use it in the animal world? Well, you say that because you, you are in charge of the meeting. But you know, the individual who is in charge physically, so to speak, is not necessarily the most powerful of us. And, and in my book, that's one of the things I discuss is that... Uh, for example, people always say males are dominant over females. Yes, many males in the primate world are physically dominant over the females, but that doesn't mean they run the show. That doesn't mean they, they decide everything. And the power is often in the hands of females. Well said. There you go. You've met the panel. But what's this? Mayday, mayday. I have an important mission for you all. You all know Julia. She's a Naked Scientist producer. Very creative. But before we get stuck into our panellist spotlights, I want you to know that we have a puzzle waiting for us to solve at the end of the show. 
Each of our experts will be given one clue which they have to decipher. The more answers we get right along the way, the easier our Mayday puzzle will be. Back to Julia for the clue. Your first clue is the thesis titled A Survey of Radial Velocities in the Zodiacal Dust Cloud was written by which rock star? They're an absolute champion who needs no sympathy because he will not let you go. Oh, uh, probably Brian May, I guess. Evan, you've said it so quickly and so confidently that e- Emma gave me a smile over the uh, the recording that we're doing. It's because I, I shared, I, um, I had his old office um, for my, oh last, my, God. my last position as a fellow at Imperial College. So I, I was in the office where he wrote that thesis and there's a bookcase with a whole load of them and one of them signed. No way. Oh. And and he's also got a claim to fame as well because you've taken over his office. Absolutely. Exactly. That's what he tells all of his friends. There you go, Brian. Well, we'll keep that on the back burners for right towards the end of the show. Let's stick with you, Eben. This year marks a rather special birthday for your mini computer, doesn't it? How long has the Raspberry Pi been around now? We've been around a decade. We launched on the 29th of February 2012, which of course creates birthday challenges for us. We've only really <laughs> had two, two birthdays. Uh, but yeah, we've been around for almost exactly 10 years now. And do you remember those original months? They were just a blur, right? I mean, they were a little bit like the first months of having a new child, right? That everything sort of just smears together into this incredibly hectic kind of blur. But yeah, I, I mean, like, things stand out, you know, sort of arriving at the punter on um, a Northampton Street um, in the evening on the first day. Is that a pub, run. Eben? Yeah, yeah, it's a pub uh, on Northampton Street in Cambridge. And uh, yeah, realising that we'd sold 100,000 or taken orders. For, we didn't have 100,000 units. But realising that we'd taken orders for 100,000 Raspberry Pis in the first 24 hours, you know, sort of these kind of just these kind of flashes. Very first time I went to the factory in Wales where we've ended up building all of the Raspberry Pis now. You know, just these kind of, just these sort of just little vignettes, little moments. A little flashbacks. And it, it is, you know, that's an awful number of orders to have placed within the first 24 hours. <laughs> but it, it's an accessible tool, isn't it? How much does one of these things cost? Um, well, our cheapest units, so Raspberry Pi Zero costs five bucks, right? So it really is the latte computer. You know, you can have a Linux workstation for the price of a, of a latte or, or a bit less than the price of a pint of beer these days. The most expensive thing about the most expensive thing we make is, is $75. That's the, the eight gigabyte, the largest memory version of Raspberry Pi 4, which is our most modern platform. And, you know, going back to the, the fact that it's the, the latte of computer systems, is that going to change? Because I feel like there's a lot of other industries that are relying on computing at the moment, and you guys are obviously all dealing with a chip shortage. That feels like it's been going on for a long time. What's what's the latest on that, and how does that apply to Raspberry <laughs> Pi? Uh, it does feel like it's been It's actually only really been going on for, in terms of its impact on our output, it's only been going on for about a year. Um, so March, it's strange to look back, March last year was our largest ever month for sales with over 800,000 units going out the door. I think it's making fools of us all, honestly, trying to predict when this is going to end it has to end um i suspect though it's not going to end you know it's not going to end next month that's for certain and what is the issue again it's interesting the the, the, the semiconductor industry is a very cyclic industry this, these things come around all the time um but um yeah so maybe every five years you get some sort of shortage situation and then in the middle you then get a glut where where the manufacturers are desperate to sell you product and and, uh, and they, they don't have enough they don't have enough demand to meet the supply rather than not having enough supply to meet demand um Talking to people at Raspberry Pi, Mike Buffum, our, our chief commercial officer, who's been doing this for the best part of 40 years, it's as bad as he's ever seen. And if you think if you go back 40 years, that takes you back into uh, sort of to 1980, um, it's, it's fairly likely, if this is the worst we've seen in 40 years, it's pr- fairly likely it's the worst we've ever seen in the entire history of electronics, because electronics itself only goes back, solid state electronics only goes back another 30 years really before that. Um, so this really is a, it is a, it's a once in a lifetime uh, offer. And of course, it's driven partly by demand, um, partly by supply. Um, there was a, uh, there was a miscalculation, I think, happened at the start of the pandemic on a lot of people's part, including, including mine, which is an assumption there would be a recession. And that when there's a recession, you don't want to get caught holding too much inventory. And so people dialed down their orders. At the same time, people were stuck at home 
and they weren't able to go out to restaurants. Uh, they weren't able to go and consume services. For many people, their income, even people who weren't able to work during the pandemic, their income was supported to some degree by, by furlough payments. And so the money that people couldn't spend on services, they tend to spend on goods. And many of those goods had semiconductors in. So you had a, an almost unnoticed positive demand shock and a negative supply shock. And the eventual unwinding of that is this kind of imbalance in the supply chain. Once an imbalance starts, as we found with toilet rolls two years ago, once an imbalance in the supply chain starts, it's very hard to persuade people not to engage in antisocial behavior hoarding. We're probably now no longer in the stage where this is driven by fundamentals. It's largely driven by panic. Apart from waiting for it to end, are there any other solutions? Is there something that Raspberry Pi can do? Um, I think waiting for it to end is <laughs> waiting for it to end is what we're all doing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, on a on a component by component basis, on Raspberry Pi, enormous amount of engineering and commercial effort goes into finding alternative sources for components. On any given day, there will be a different component which is causing the shortage. Which is, if the factory isn't running today, it, it's very seldom the same component twice that's causing the uh, causing the problem. So there's an enormous amount of work goes in there. There are certain irreducible components though on the board for which we have no substitutes. Um, those are the components that regardless of how much engineering work we do, there isn't that much we can do other than wait for it to end. So making making your own chips, is that what it, it what it could come down to? Well, the interesting, of course, the interesting thing is that last year, Raspberry Pi started making its own chips. Um, we have a, a product called RP2040, which is a, a microcontroller. So I, I mentioned earlier, big, Raspberry Pi. When I say big Raspberry Pi, I mean a PC, a thing that runs Linux, that gives you a desktop, gives you a web browser, gives you a C compiler programming tools. We have a, um, a there's another sort of Raspberry Pi product we call Raspberry Pi Pico, which is a lower end, lower power consumption embedded device with a microcontroller inside. Um, we make that microcontroller. And so one of the bright spots of the last year is while it's been a difficult time to be a semiconductor customer, it's been probably the best year ever to become a semiconductor supplier. And we became a semiconductor supplier in January of last year. And we've seen enormous interest uh, in that RP2040 platform as an alternative to a whole heap of microcontroller products out there from guys like ST Microelectronics that you just can't buy this year. Just amazing growth there from Eben and Raspberry Pi over the past 10 years. From baffling British weather. The sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here. To looking at a cheetah from the inside out. Games making their way to the clinic and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top-up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com slash short or subscribe to Naked Specials wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come rethinking the importance of dreams, the role gender has to play in the animal kingdom, and Newsworthy, our brand new quiz. Now though, up for grabs is another Mayday puzzle clue. And Emma, this one's coming to you. There's antimony, arsenic, nickelimium, selenium, and ha- alumin- aluminum. Oh, I have to say aluminum to do this properly? That's very sad. Sorry, just was like my periodic table there. Are you feeling in your element right now? Well... I'm hoping so, because here is your next clue. Silicon is in which group of the periodic table? There's no medals for guessing that one. No, because and I'll tell you why. is because I'm an astronomer and our periodic table, no, no word of lie, goes hydrogen, helium, metals. Because hydrogen, helium, us, metals. <laughs> well, yeah, because the universe is 70-something percent hydrogen and then the rest of it's helium. And then there's like a little tiny bit of everything else. I'm like, who cares, especially for a first stars astronomer where there was nothing else because of the Big Bang. So, no, it's in the metals group. I stand by that. I got it right. Thank you very much. Let's move on. We will move on and we'll go and talk a little bit more about what Emma was just saying. Uh, but in the but meantime, genuinely, what, what group was it? Siddhartha <laughs> and Franz, are you able to weigh in here? No, I don't know anything about uh, the periodic table. <laughs> I should remember, but I don't. Oh, hopefully you at home have an idea, but we'll come back to this and maybe I can give an extra clue along the way. Now, though, Emma, I hear you never actually wanted to be an astrophysicist at all. Instead, you wanted a job in Egyptology, hunting for tombs and learning Egyptian. I want to say it didn't work out, but in your new book, I came across a chapter called Stellar Archaeology, which might make me think otherwise. This 
this isn't an actual discipline, is it? This is something that publicists have thought up to make a good soundbite. No, this is this is a real scientific field full of cutting edge technology and well, incredibly excellent research carried out by, by scientists called stellar archaeologists. I'm very, very, very jealous of, of their name. And what they do is they try and uncover the first stars that existed in our universe that have survived and are just knocking around the neighbourhood today. Knocking around the u- the neighbourhood today. I mean, you're going to have to tell us a little bit more because you've piqued my interest. So we think that if the first stars, if there were some stars that were small enough, because the bigger the star, the faster it fuses through its fuel. It's, it, the bigger the star, the greedier it is, the quicker it explodes, basically. So if we can find some really small first stars, then they might have survived the whole 13 billion years and still be around in the Milky Way. The problem is that they have been through a 13 billion year timeline of stuff being chucked at them, of pollution, basically, of what I just referred to, of all these heavy elements like lithium, beryllium, boron, silicon, all of these things that were created as the universe went along, they're camouflaged. And so stellar archaeologists, the job is, is to look at the light from, let's say, I don't know, several hundred billion stars in the Milky Way and dust it off, dust off this light to figure out what is the pollution and what is a real first, real pristine, really clean star lying under all of that that could be one of these these first ever stars to exist. And how does one go about choosing where to look? Because I'm assuming you, you must have masses of data if you point your telescope anywhere. So where do you try and find these, what you would have thought are extinct stars? Telescope time is money. It costs a lot of time and patience to get any time on a telescope to observe, and it's, it's money. It's £10,000 a night or more. So you have to know where to point. And the best guess we can really have is that we know that the, the stars tend to migrate out of the disk of a galaxy into the halo of a galaxy. And so that's a good first starting point. We can just look in the halo and and that's indeed where we we do tend to do most of our observations at the minute but there's still billions tens of billions hundreds of billions to go through so it really is a case of gridding up the sky just meticulously searching for that for that hidden treasure as it were and and this is why it all links back to egyptology for me because it's the same kind of thing what people never tell you about for example the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb is that Howard Carter, he didn't just stumble across it on his first go. He was there for five years, having gridded out the desert patch that he'd he'd got permission for. And it was on his last dig, as in his funding was about to be cut off, that he found this treasure. And and it really is the same kind of thing for this stellar archaeology. We we have to be meticulous. We have to grid off the sky, use an educated guess, but it's going to take time and grit. Do you think it will be successful. Do you think you will find one of these stars? I think so. As a scientist, I can only give my my well-educated guess, but we are getting so close now. We've managed to find a second star, if you will. So a star that has so few heavy elements in it that it has to have been from a very, very early time in the universe. And we, we believe that that star is kind of the first ascendant in that it was formed from the gas from the explosion of a first star if that all makes sense so the point is we're getting really really close now and our technology is improving all the time so i have a lot of hope for the next decade for this field and emma how do we look back in time and observe these first stars well the great thing about light is that it has a speed limit which means that it takes time to travel so when we look at the sun don't look at the sun But when we look at the sun, then the light from the sun is about eight minutes old. It's taken eight minutes to get to us. So we're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes in the past. When we look at light from the nearest galaxy, we're seeing Andromeda 2.5 million years in the past. So what we do, what I do as a day job is I use radio telescopes to tune into radio light that has been traveling to us for 13 billion years. So we can see the universe as it was. 13 billion years and pick up the light from this era of the first stars and learn all about it and in real time if, if you if you will it's not through simulation it's it's through watching 
Well, I have a small question. Uh, yeah, go, France. In a cloudy country, notoriously cloudy like the UK, uh, the telescopes must have a, a bit of trouble. Or do, or do you do your observations in Patagonia or some, some other place where you go to, to do the telescope work? This is why I'm a radio astronomer and why radio astronomy <laughs> really flourished in the UK. Radio uh, waves can uh, penetrate clouds, dust, a lot of the mm -hmm. atmosphere, a lot more than All the optical. Right. And, and so we can observe day and night. Hold on to that thought as well, Emma. Uh, that's a great question from Franz because we might, we might pop back to it a little later on. Early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was an uptick in the number of reports of vivid dreaming. Many people claimed their dreams were becoming graphic and easier to remember. Siddhartha, do we have any ideas as to why during these early lockdowns, people may have experienced a difference in their dreams? Absolutely. We were all united in the fear of death. We, we spend most of our lives thinking that death will not come or, or come much later or, you know, we don't want to think about it. And suddenly we all felt very unsafe. I, I assume there's a lot of neurological mechanisms that are, that are changing due to this fear. Can you talk us through any of those and, and what's happening in the brain? Well, we're all capable of fear responses. Uh, and we, when you're living a life as, as an affluent uh, member of society, most of the anxiety is delayed, postponed, or just repressed. So we're talking about hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, uh, neurotransmitters like uh, norepinephrine, dopamine. So there's several mechanisms, molecular mechanisms that will make us feel urging for, for novelty or be afraid of novelty. When you, when, if you put a rat in a new space uh, before exploration goes on, they tend to freeze and they, they freeze for a while and then they will not go to sleep. And at some point they will go to sleep. If they didn't experience anything bad, then everything normalizes and they will become quite curious about the environment and, and show novelty seeking behaviors. I think in terms of what happened, and it's still happening with COVID, many, we have to remember many people in the world are not vaccinated in Africa, in the Caribbean, in many countries in the world, in fact. But for most people, the first few months, the first year, the first year and a half was a period of loss, was a period of, and so many, many things got compounded. And in different studies across the globe, uh, it was clear that most people were responding with insomnia, with anxiety, an increased latency for, for sleep onset, and, and very vivid nightmares. And nightmares that started to have some common themes of contagion. So for example, in the study that we published uh, on uh, COVID dreams last year, we, we found that there's a continuity between what people experience during the waking life in terms of symptoms of, of, psych, of, of, of mental suffering and in terms of the contents of the dreams using probe words such as contagion. And similar results have been observed by different groups of researchers. And it brings us to a collective experience. A lot of what goes on in, in dreams is to do with your personal unconscious, with your personal life, with your personal challenges and desires and fears. But sometimes these are also the same as your neighbors. And why do we have these dreams? Is there a reason behind them? I believe so. Dreams are part of the neurobiological machinery of adaptation. Uh, sleep is super important for adaptation. It really helps us make a triage of the memories that need to be kept, those that need to be forgotten or repressed, the stuff that needs to be recombined so that we can have new ideas. And dreams come on top of that as a very sophisticated simulation of potential futures, of counterfactuals. And of course, this is not apparent for, for most people in contemporary urban societies, because this is not the setting in which dreams evolved at all. If we want to understand what dreams are or what they how they were selected, we need to think of the evolution of dreaming. There's kind of a notion that dreams are pretty meaningless, right? So it might be a result of stress. There might be a result of something going on in your life. I think this notion is detrimental to human beings. <laughs> you know, our ancestors are, were dreamers. We're not, I'm not talking just about human ancestors. I'm talking about mammalian ancestors. And dreams were a very important part of the cultural process. It's very obvious if you look at the earliest literary texts in Sumerian Egypt, you'll see that the, the roles were very complicated, very sophisticated already. So we have to imagine that this was so uh, before writing was invented. And every culture before, let's say, the, the last 500 years assigned a very special role for dreams as a, as a space for, for divination, revelation, and, 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 and decision-making, in fact, in public as well as private life. And in most, if not all, current uh, 
semi-nomadic societies, hunter-gatherer societies, dreams occupy a very special place. And so it's actually uh, quite naive of us, contemporary urban people, to believe that we can fare well in this world without the, the advice of dreams. That's not to say that all dreams are, are uh, clearly meaningful. That's not to say that they're easy to interpret. That's not to say that there's only one interpretation to a dream. But to believe that dreams are, are nonsense is not to connect with our own introspection when we were children or adolescents and we had a more easy contact with their dreams. We all have dream every night, but few people in cities remember their dreams, much less apply dreams to aid in their navigation of life. And this is what I think we need to rescue. And Siddhartha, do you get enough sleep? Do you dream enough? Nowadays, yes. Nowadays, yes. Until the pandemic, I was not getting enough sleep. And then when the pandemic hit, I was I changed my life in many ways. And this is one way in which things got really better. I'm sleeping you know, as much as I need, as much as I want every night. And how, how do you measure that? How do you know that you're getting enough? I live uh, near the equator and the sun is up around 5.15. So now I, I usually go to, to bed with my partner around 9 p.m. And, and then I wake up spontaneously. Thanks very much there to Siddhartha. Much has changed for business owners, managers and staff recently. But with over 30 years experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls, or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. In this episode, I'm joined by an A-team of science-based specialists who are sharing their expertise. We've got computational whiz, Eben Upton, celestial superstar, Emma Chapman, the doctor of your dreams, Siddhartha Ribeiro, and if I can stop him monkeying around, it's Franz de Waal. Now, running throughout the show, we have our Mayday puzzle. We're collecting clues from each of the panellists, which we can hopefully then use to crack the code waiting for us at the end of the show. Clue number three is on its way. Siddhartha, this one's for you. Oh, yeah. You go, little guy. Wiggle those wings. Are you on the formation tour? Oh, sorry. Once again, distracted by the absolute moves on this superstar... But they are part of your third clue. Which insect is known for their infamous waggle dance? Honestly, Sasha Fierce, better watch out. Behave yourself! The bee. The bee! It's a great thought. Let's keep that in mind for later on in the show. Our last spotlight is primatologist Franz de Waal. And this year marks the 40th anniversary of, I hope I'm right in thinking, Franz, his first publication, Chimpanzee Politics, something a lot of us in the UK probably feel well accustomed to watching as of late. Franz, your new publication is called Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. This is wild. Can we, I've never thought of doing this, but can we actually attach gender to animals? Yeah, I think so, because uh, gender is the, the cultural side of the sex binary. And, and you know, the, the sexual binary itself is already complex enough. It's not really a binary. It's like a an almost binary and gender is more the cultural expression the social norms the education the all the cultural overlays and and gender are usually divide in masculine and feminine and everything in between and, and so there's a much more flexible concept that relates to what you learn during your lifetime and you know the the primates like a chimpanzee is adult when he's 16 so it's a very slow development and learns a, a ton of things when, when they are young, some of which is from adult females, some from adult males. And so they also have a cultural transmission of how you behave as a male or a female in society. And in that sense, they, they are gendered too. So we, for example, we have evidence that young females pick up more behavior from their moms than young males do. Young males often look around and look at adult males I call it self-socialization. They emulate adult males more than they emulate their mom. And so self-socialization leads already to a transmission of, um, let's say, cultural norms about how you behave as a male or a female. So in this chimpanzee community, 
if we're talking about the young then, what are those behaviours? The evidence that we have comes mostly from these culture studies that we do, which is mostly on what you eat and how you eat things, <laughs> because it's easy to measure tool use, for example. Uh, for the field workers find that easier than social behavior. And so, for example, we know a, a recent study on orangutans in the field, uh, in, in the forest, where we found that uh, young females eat exactly the same foods as their mom. You know, there are thousands of plants and fruits out there, but they have exactly the same diet as their moms. Whereas uh, young males, the sons, they have a much broader uh, choice and, and because they, they mimic also the behavior of the males around that they see. And so we have, we have evidence that uh, of this self-socialization ID. And, and another important point when you talk about gender is the gender diversity. We have individuals who are more homosexual than heterosexual in their behavior. We have individuals who don't exactly fit the roles that you usually see. So you may have, for example, a, a big adult male who, who doesn't want to play the macho game, doesn't want to be the dominant male, and doesn't, doesn't even engage in confrontations with other males and stays out of all of that. And you may have females, I describe in my book, a female named Donna, who from very young uh, was into wrestling and mock fighting the way young males usually do. Uh, and she sought out adult males to do it with. And when she grew older, um, she grew into a, a male-like character. She had the big shoulders, the big hair, the big head, uh, the big hands of a male. And she associated with males. She hung out with them the whole day. And, and from a distance, she would swear she was a male. And so that same gender diversity that you see in human society, where uh, not everyone fits exactly the mold, is visible in the other primates. And that's also why I think the word gender is applicable to them. I think it's really interesting that you say that those blurring of boundaries is the same in human populations, but we do really love to put people in boxes, don't we? We like to say yeah. it's black or white. That's so unfortunate. In human society, we are a symbolic species. So we love labeling. You're a man, you're a woman, you're, you're homosexual, you're heterosexual. And if you fall in between these boxes, uh, too bad for you. We, we, we can't handle you in, in our society. The beauty of primates, uh, they're not in every respect ideal, I would say, because they can be sometimes brutal, but they, they do tolerate these individuals. So, so, for example, Donna was perfectly well integrated in her community. And uh, I've never actually noticed that they are intolerant of individuals who are slightly different than they are. And, and for example, homosexual behavior, of course, I study also bonobos and I describe extensively bonobo behavior. Uh, I, I consider them bisexual because they, they don't even seem to have a preference for one gender over the other or something. So, so I think they, for them, that's, an, that's not a major issue. And, and Franz, just briefly, what else is there that we can learn from the gender of your, your primates? Well, one, one other thing that I think is important to learn is that because people always think the natural order is men dominate women, males dominate females. Our two closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, in one, one of them, the males are dominant, the other one, the females are dominant. And, and even in societies where the males dominate physically, they are not necessarily the most powerful individuals politically. So, so, so I, in my previous book, I described Mama, the chimpanzee, who was alpha female for 40 years uh, and, and saw a lot of alpha males come and go during her lifetime. And, and she was an absolute central and powerful character in the community, even though she was physically incapable of beating up males. So I think that's an important message that I want to give is that we should distinguish physical dominance and power and that there's plenty of leadership and power in females in the primates. Franz de Waal there, and thank you ever so much. Now, we're going to be playing a little game we like to call newsworthy i'm going to split you into two teams and give you each two science news stories that we've recently covered here at the naked scientist for each story you're going to have three quick questions related albeit maybe tenuously uh, to that topic the team which answers the most questions correctly will be the rulers of the land of science quizzes and get to sit on a theoretical throne of glory emma and eben your team won siddhartha and franz your team too and that works very well doesn't it siddhartha Mm -hmm. I'm really uh, glad to be in the same boat as Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. The okay, the boat will float, I'm sure. The boat, the <laughs> boat will definitely float. So the four categories for this week's newsworthy stories are smell, Mars, dogs and lettuce. 
Now, I'm going to give you the chance to choose which categories you want to answer, Team 1 and Team 2. But to decide who gets to go first, I have an icebreaker question. So this one's a finger on the buzzer kind of jobby. First person to answer this correctly has the first pick of our newsworthy stories. You ready? Here it comes. In the UK, which government commissioner really put her foot in it at the end of last month by saying that girls do not take up physics at school because they, quote, dislike hard maths? It was Catherine Bowles Singh, isn't it? It was indeed. She's the... uh, social mobility head and she said they don't like it they don't want to do it and she later remarked that that was a pretty natural thing i mean emma you must be somebody who blooming loves hard maths how does that how does that make you feel I mean, yes i do and i am a gender equality campaigner in in the physics and the science world so honestly i mean i'm angry but also i've had to just learn to suppress the anger because otherwise <laughs> i'd be angry all of the time because this is not a new comment And yeah, I mean, it just means I get to spend less time on the science that I love because now I have to go and comment on this. Oh, (laughs) and it it is damaging, (laughs) isn't it? Yeah. Out of smell, Mars, dogs and lettuce, which topic would you like to tackle? I have a feeling everyone's going to be expecting me to choose Mars, which is why... (laughs) Every pub quiz I do, I never know the answers to anything <laughs> astronomical, and then I sit there and shame. So, Evan, do you? Have... Should we should we agree, should we agree on letters? Because neither of us are letters experts, and therefore, yeah, we, we, when we when we get the answer wrong, there will be no shame. It's an interesting choice to play to your weaknesses and not your strengths. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, it's lettuce for team one. Lettuce for team one. One interesting fact about lettuce is that it's seen as having uh, benefits for psychological health and that for long time spent in space, having a green leafy plant growing and also as food offers a lot of sort of mental health benefits to astronauts. Astronauts living on the International Space Station can experience bone density loss due to the effects of living in prolonged microgravity. Emma, you couldn't get away from space, could you? (laughs) Recently, scientists added a novel ingredient to lettuce to boost bone strength. First up, how much bone density loss can be experienced by astronauts for each month that they spend in space? Is it 0.1%, 0.5% or 1%? I'd actually say about one because I know it's really significant. They have to they have to do a lot of training when they come back. But Evan, do you have an idea? I'll I'll go with I'll go with one uh, as well. well. That's correct. It's one percent. On to the next question. Space lettuce could help to combat this problem. Scientists modified the plant to produce a fusion protein called PTHFC. It involves a crafty bit of gene editing. But what does PTHFC help to regulate in the blood? Is it phosphorus, calcium? Or fibrinogen. I mean, I'm, I would guess calcium, but that would, that would be my guess as well because you know. Of course, it is, and that's why calcium is essential for bone density. <laughs> that one percent a month is absolutely outrageous, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's. They really have to work hard when they come back. Uh, osteoporosis and breakages, and if you were to look after yourself when you do come back, is it able? To, are you able to replace that bone density that you've lost? Yeah, I believe so. I'm not certainly not an expert on this, but um, I, I believe you can recover it with with training so it's not lifelong and the third part of the question it's pretty tough to grow food under microgravity but the space station has its own space garden called the vegetable production system it's known as veggie which of the following vegetables have been successfully grown on board is it a kale b carrots or c spinach um i'm gonna go with spinach because it's really easy to grow because i've grown it and i kill everything Evan. Uh, yeah i'm gonna go with spinach out of a sort of blame blame diffusion kind of yeah no that's good yeah spinach definitely spinach (laughs) the answer is kale (laughs) yeah crispy kale that's exactly what you want when you're up there on the space station so out of those three questions you take away two points two out of three ain't bad guys yeah no that's i'm I'm happy with that and i just can't believe that we chose lettuce and i still got the space shame but there we go (laughs) over to sadata and franz now team two so what you're left with Mars, smell, and dogs. Which would you like, gents? I'd love to do dogs. Likewise. Here we go then. For team two, Franz and Siddhartha, dogs. It points to the huge emphasis that humans and dogs place on mutual gaze. This ability to attract one another's attention with facial expression and deepen that bond. 
By analysing the musculature in the face of dogs and the faces of wolves, it's been found that our four-legged pets have different physiological faces, including a reduction in slow-twitch muscle fibres compared to their old ancestors. These changes have resulted in more expressive faces. But what muscle is it that gives Lassie her puppy dog eyes? Is it the buccinator muscle, the caninus muscle, or the levator muscle? Uh, I, I know it's the muscle close to the eye, but I, I'm not familiar with all these muscles. Do you know that, Siddhartha? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a muscle close to the eye that, that makes the eye a bit rounder and so more puppy-like. That's yeah. correct, yeah. Do the first one, maybe. It's actually the levator muscle. We have one called levator ani, and it's uh, it's in the human pelvis. But this one sits just above the eyebrow, very different. <laughs> and, yeah. and it tugs basically on the eyebrow. So that's why if you look at my dog, my brother's cockapoo, he's got these, it's a, a ridiculous dog, but he's got these massive eyebrows that are very expressive. Second question, dogs have been crowned the UK's favorite pet. But according to 2020 survey, what breed is the most common to have as part of the family? Is it A, a Springer Spaniel, B, a Labrador Retriever, or C, a German Shepherd? See, what's happened here is we've given Emma space and we've given you guys a question for the UK. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I would say A, but I, what do you say, Franz? Yeah, it could be number one or two. Not, not, I don't think it's a German Shepherd. But um, yeah, number, let's go with number one. Oh, it's so close. It's a Labrador Retriever, so it's big. <laughs> the cuteness of dogs has been thought to have been derived in part by humans' domestication of them over a millennia. Other than losing the ability to howl like wolves, what else have dogs lost as they've evolved? Is it a rigid breeding season, the ability to see in colour, or the ability to taste coriander? They don't have a rigid breeding season. Let's go with that. Yeah, that's correct. So with wolves, they do have quite a rigid breeding season. It's about eight weeks or so. For those in North America, that's from late January through to March. But across the world, that does that does change slightly. It's two out of three for team one. And for team two, Siddhartha and Franz, it's one out of three. It's still all to play for. You're listening to a pre-recorded episode of The Naked Scientist with me, Harry Lewis, and a glorious panel. It's Evan Upton, Emma Chapman, Siddhartha Ribeiro, and Franz de Waal, who are so generously sharing their expertise. Now, we're back with part two of Newsworthy, and the scores currently are one point to Team 2, that's Franz and Siddhartha, and two points to Emma and Evan. OK, Team 1, you're up again. What's left? It's Mars or Smell. Uh, let's go with Mars. Come on, let's embarrass myself. It's, it's, it's inevitable. Let's do it. Had to happen, Emma. Here we go then. Mars. A recent recording came back from the Perseverance rover on Mars, which to me just sounded like a bit of windy audio. But this clip actually reveals something quite interesting. Sound on Mars travels at two different speeds. What gas is it in Mars's atmosphere that's responsible for this dual speed of sound waves? Is it A, oxygen, B, carbon dioxide, or C, nitrogen? Well, I know nothing, so I'm <laughs> going to say carbon horror. dioxide because that's where most of the... Yeah, just, I've, just got, I've just got horror on my face at everyone that... No, Emma, I think it was fair to say you were giving Eben a chance to go first, right? Yeah. You didn't yeah. want to steal no, the yeah. spotlight. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Ed- edit that out. Edit that out. Eben, you, you go. So carbon dioxide is, is most of the atmosphere, but now I've got this sneaking paranoia that it's that, that it's, the, it's the nitrogen that gives you the second gives you a, a second speed of sound. So, ah. Uh, Let's go with the carbon dioxide. I Let's like, I like dioxide. the confidence. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Well deduced, carbon dioxide is the one responsible. Now, Olympus Mons is a shield volcano on Mars with a peak of 26 kilometres when measured from the plains. Roughly how many Mount Everests tall is that? Is it one? Is it three? Or is it five? I have no idea. So it's about 25,000 feet. And you said 25 kilometres. I'm on the right team. And there are 3,000 feet in uh, three, three. Yeah, Everest is in total 8,849 metres tall. 
here we go then, Emma. It's, it's your time to shine now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. M- Mars has two moons. Can you give me the correct name for one of them out of this selection? A, Phobos, B, Europa, or C, Mimus? And apologies if there's any mispronunciation there. That's that's Mimus, right? Oh, I think it's Phobos, isn't it? Is it Phobos? Phobos oh, and Mimus. I'm panicking. Fear and panic. Do you know what? You've got the, you've even, fear and panic. <laughs> I'm actually Mimus. sweating. I'm sweating right now. I'm not enjoying this. This was not part of the package. I don't like it. Well done, Eben. <laughs> Can I just put a caveat here? And that's that I look at the first stars, which are 13 billion years ago. So I really don't care about anything close by. That's I'm like, right. they're just rocks that's in the right. way. None of us like, care. Rocks. Yeah, get out of the way. <laughs> and the other one is Diamos. So at the end of that round, that brings you up to a total of five points, Team One. Wait a second. Does that mean Team One have got it? They've won. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> Siddhartha and Franz, you've got to bring something back, right? There's a couple of points to be had here. Yeah, we get a, we get a bonus point. You get a bonus point, of course. So, so here we go. Your final topic of what's newsworthy is smell. Anything that we smell is basically a molecule, and any molecule has thousands of different features. So we can look at those features and see if we can predict how pleasant something is. And when we do that, it turns out we can predict just from the molecule itself, which odors people are going to find nice and which ones are going to find stinky. A recent study asked several different populations from around the globe to rank, pardon the pun, smells to determine the role culture plays in our preference for whiffs. The overwhelming result for the worst smell was described as being similar to that of sweaty feet. But what chemical is responsible for this disgusting odour? Is it A, isovaleric acid, B, ethyl butyrate, or C, octanoic acid? I don't think it's B. That leaves you with A or C. Yeah, there was was a study of Limburg cheese, you know, that that has a component that's in uh, smelly feet also. Really? Yeah, yeah, and and actually it's a cheese, a very favourite cheese. Maybe it's A. You think it's A? Okay, I think it's A. Let's do A. I think it's A. Oh, it is A indeed. Isovaleric acid. That's one. The comeback begins now, if we add the bonus point on. Many animals rely heavily on scent for guiding behaviour, but the human nose is also pretty nifty at discriminating between them. How many scents are our noses thought to be able to tell apart? Is it A, one million, B, one billion, or C, one trillion? I think it's one million. (laughs) One trillion. That seems like ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let, let's go with finish the first, yeah. We can apparently tell the difference between one trillion different types of smell. Do we have words for one trillion s- smells? <laughs> <laughs> Every type of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> one of the main symptoms of several COVID-19 causing variants is a loss of taste and smell. But which part of the nose is thought to be impacted by the virus and therefore responsible for wiping out scent? Is it A, olfactory neurons, B, nose hair, or C, epithelial support cells? Epithelial support cells. A pretty good end to finish on, I think. Two points taken there, but it does mean, of course, that uh, at the end of Newsworthy, our very winner-worthy victors are Team One, Emma and Eben. Congratulations. How does it feel? Yeah. Uh, I totally carried the team, so yeah. I'm, I'm really, I'm really pleased with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I just ever, truly, we know. truly we are we we we're correctly named Team What. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it's our last clue in the Mayday puzzle before reaching the big bad boss level. Remember, each clue will help us when we finally join heads at the end of the show. Here it comes. My ETA is about 10 minutes, so could you stick the cat along because I'll have a cap when I get home. All right, yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. I wrote this symbol a lot during my PhD, but do you know what it is? What Greek letter in the alphabet is used as an abbreviation for a micrometer or a micron? I delta you a good one there, so you better get it right. Any idea? Oh, yeah, that's the the U is a long tail, but I don't know how you call that. U, yeah. <laughs> U sounds good. What is it? Siddhartha, what's the, um, what, what is it? What's the answer? Mew. It is indeed. Okay, before we get to that Mayday final puzzle, I have a little set of quick fire questions. We've heard from all our wonderful experts but they have so much more juicy science to spill and it's time for a quick fire round to squeeze yet more facts into any brain space you might have left. Eben, where is the 
most remote location that your computer has travelled to? Certainly been used in Antarctica for photographing penguins. It's overwintered uh, in Antarctica, which is a pretty brutal environment. The other one's the International Space Station. Actually, of course, the International Space Station is pretty close if it goes over your head, a lot closer than Antarctica. But it's certainly an even more extreme environment. I mean, what is it? What's it doing on the on the space station? Uh, we have well, we have uh, we've had four two pairs of uh, of Raspberry Pis uh, on the station. The first ones went up with Tim Peake. Um, a few years ago, they're being used to run uh, computer programs uh, written by school children. I mean, tens of thousands of the Raspberry Pi Foundation runs a program called Astro Pi in partnership with the European Space Agency, and tens of thousands of children have had a chance to run their um, uh, uh, run their code on the ISS. With those kids that are running code on the Raspberry Pi, are there any other cool projects? I imagine there's a whole list, but what's some of the coolest things that you've seen your computer involved in? There is a there's an engineer in Japan who used a Raspberry Pi to build a cucumber sorter. Now Japanese his parents own a cucumber farm and they're getting on in years and and they don't want to be in Japanese cucumbers apparently I think it's 23 grades depending on how straight how green how spiny the cucumbers are um, and, and they, they they were not enjoying spending their their later years sorting cucumbers so he built an automated system around a Raspberry Pi to do that for them and it's it's a silly example but it's kind of emblematic of the sort of uh, creativity that, that the Raspberry Pi platform has unlocked in individuals and in businesses. Next up, Emma, we've spoken about your radio telescopes. Do you listen to stuff or do you see stuff when you're using a radio telescope? I think you can you can say both. You're, you're using lights, so we're used to using C in conversation. But you can also plug in your headphones and actually listen to the hiss. And that's how we first discovered the galaxy in radio waves. We heard a hiss on the telephone line. Oh, amazing. And, wh- and whereabouts do you need to place these? I imagine it's got to be quite quiet, the environment you put them. Normally, yes. I mean, I'm helping to build one in the Western Australian desert. I've just visited one in the North Californian mountains. But the one that I work with mainly is in the Netherlands called Lofa. And so there we just have to be very clever about how we remove the noise. Uh, and what happens if your, your mobile phone goes off? It swamps out the galaxy entirely. <laughs> Does that mean you have to put them somewhere special? Um, yeah, I mean, ideally you, you turn them off <laughs> um, completely, but then you can get rooms that are Faraday cages, which means the electromagnetic waves just cannot cannot get out. But uh, these, these telescopes are seriously sensitive. So the one that we're building, the SKA, um, that will be able to detect the equivalent of an airport radar on a planet 10 light years away. Wow. And, and in Australia, you're doing a project you just said. What does that consist of? Uh, that consists of 130,000 antennas. Um, they look like Christmas trees. If you imagine a Christmas tree about two metres tall, made of wire, that's what it looks like. 130,000 of them. We're joining them all up this way and that. And it's the equivalent of a gigantic telescope. And that's what we're using to listen for the first stars. 130,000. That's outrageous. Fantastic. So data, what impacts does a lack of proper sleep have on our ability to, to plan for the future and, and making decisions. Not having a good night of sleep is, is a liability in the short term as well as in the long term. So the next day you will have cognitive trouble. You have difficulty remembering easy stuff. You have uh, difficulties learning new stuff. You also ha- be emotionally impaired. You won't be able to deal with negative stimuli the same way you would if you had your full night of sleep. And of course, there's a snowball effect. If you, if you have a job that prevents you from, from sleeping properly or for whatever the reason, you cannot get your good night of sleep every night, you're going to have a compound effect that actually is very detrimental to society. Now, in, down the road, you're talking about depression, you're talking about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and you know, many, many years later, Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it's really a, a, a bad thing to skip a night of sleep. And do you have any sort of method for helping us rescue our dreams so we can better remember them? Yes. Three steps. Before you go to sleep, think about it and make a, an intention in your mind that you're going to remember your dream and record it. When you wake up, don't move from your bed. Don't talk to anybody. Don't do anything but remember. Try to remember and bring those images together and, 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 and recreate this, this narrative. And then write it down or, or record it in audio. And then the third one, which is actually few people do it, is bring that into your life, into your waking life. Tell it to your spouse, to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, and make it part of, of your own in, internal conversation 
if you keep a dream diary, it's like getting many, many pieces of a puzzle. At some point, you will stop seeing just the, the data points and you'll see a trajectory. You'll see how things are going. And to have this kind of insights is very important to understand the fears and desires and challenges that we have. But it's also important for the community. And this is a word that Franz brought to the conversation today. We Dreams were always in the human lineage, not just about having an individual experience, but about sharing it that experience. And Franz, over to you. We've spoken a little bit about homosexuality and sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned bonobos. Are there any other species in which we see these kind of behaviors? Well, homosexual behavior is found in many, many primates uh, and many other species as well. But the extent to which the bonobos do it is, is exceptional. I think the only species that does quite a bit too is the dolphin, the bottlenose dolphin. And, and it's, I don't think it's accidental that the biggest clitorises in the, in the mammals, you know, all mammals have a clitoris, a mouse and an elephant, all, of, all the females have a clitoris, but um, the biggest ones are in dolphins and bonobos. And there must be that um, uh, female, female sex, uh, which is very prominent in both species, uh, must be made pleasurable. And, and that's the way it was done. And do you think, or, or does there even need to be, an evolutionary mechanism underneath that? Is there a reason why this trait persists across a lot of species? I, I think f for, the, for the dolphins, I'm not sure that I can answer that question, but for bonobos, clearly homosexual sex between the females has a, has a political function. So the females, they dominate the males, but they do so collectively. An individual bonobo is smaller than, uh, than a male and cannot do that, but the females as a group, they dominate the males. And as a result, they need to do a lot of bonding and sisterhood and hanging out together and sharing food. And the sex is part of that. So the sex is a bonding mechanism. Uh, and they actually have more sex, I think, with females, the females do, than with males. And there's now also some indications from uh, oxytocin studies in the field that um, they get more out of the sex with other females than with males. So females are probably emotionally more affected even by sex with females than with males. It's an interesting observation, and it's just a nice thought that any, any kind of social issue that you find in the world, look to the animal kingdom, because they kind of figured it all out ages ago. Thanks very much, Fran. Now, that is all the science we have time for this week, full to the absolute brim. But before we go... Mayday, mayday! I have an important mission for you all. We can't forget Julia. What a superstar. All your clues so far in this puzzle have been leading us here. So if you take what you've learned throughout the show during our May Day quiz, you should be able to compile them in order to recreate a phrase that you'll very likely have heard at the start of this month. So with the first one, the rock star, the physicist rock star, the answer was... Brian May. Brian May. Then we had, which group is silicon in? I will give you this one. It's the fourth group on the periodic table. Then we had, what does the waggle dance? Oh, I know B. it. <laughs> Go to the B. The final question Me. was... Mew. So what do we have, Emma? Please may the force be with me. <laughs> may the force be with you. It's Star Wars oh. Day. May the force. Oh. I love Star Wars Day. <laughs> so if you at home manage to combine all of those together, that's what you have. May the force be with you. Not Mew. I did have to stretch that a little bit at the end. But um, between Franz and Siddhartha, it worked very well. And, and let me just, for our Riddler, Julia, when she was off the mic, I managed to get an actual clip of what she really thinks of Star Wars. So have a listen to this. I've never seen Star Wars, actually. I've just done the whole, the whole quiz about, about that. Does it, does it matter? Yeah, no, I just don't get it. I think it's pretty, pretty awful, to be honest. Um, not my bag. There she goes again. Sadly, that's your lot. Thank you very much for listening. And thanks to our wonderful panel. That's Eben, Emma, Siddhartha and Franz. You've learned about stellar archaeology, but next week we've got another one for you. It's forensic archaeology, the specialist application of archaeological techniques to the search and recovery of evidential material from crime scenes. These scientists are often employed to analyse ancient buried remains, but they're also present in modern war zones. For instance, specialists are in Ukraine right now compiling evidence that may help in the trials of those accused of having taken part in war crimes. It might also involve a trip to the Natural History Museum. <gasps> I've said too much already. The Naked Scientists come to you from the Institute for Continuing Education at the University of Cambridge and are supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Harry Lewis. Until next time, goodbye.